This is Lauren Steiner. Welcome to tonight's edition of The Robust Opposition. I am here with Dr. Carol Paris, who is president of Physicians for a National Health Program. I just was recently introduced to Carol, who has become my newest Facebook friend through my friends, Kevin Zies and Margaret Flowers, who I've known since uh, 2011, actually. I met them when they started Occupy um, uh, Washington, D.C., but I've been working with Kevin and Margaret in a lot of activism. And when I found out that Bernie Sanders was thinking through an article that Margaret had written uh, about uh, Bernie possibly introducing not a single payer bill, but a public option bill and a lowering the Medicare age bill, I got all nervous. And uh, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a little while, but when it turned out to not be true, and we'll talk about what happened in the interim since that was floated out there by Bernie, I asked if they would come on the show and they recommended Dr. Paris. So Carol, thank you very much for being on my show. Oh, thank you for having me, Lauren. It's a pleasure to be here. Great. So the first question I wanna ask you is, tell us about Physicians for a National Healthcare Program and tell us about single payer. For those, of pe for those people who don't understand the difference between single payer, a public option, and um, uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act, maybe just give a very quick primer on that. Okay, well, uh, Physicians for a National Health Program is a single issue uh, organization that has been in existence since 1987, and our single issue is single payer, which is also called uh, Medicare for all, and um, also sometimes called a universal or a national health program. But we really like to use uh, national improved Medicare for all or Medicare for all as the um, as the descriptor. And what that really is, is a way of financing health care uh, such that it is all of the financing goes into one, um, one pot of money, you could think of it as. And it is very much fashioned after our Medicare program uh, that has been in existence since 1965 uh, that ensures everyone from 65 and over. So what we're proposing is to lower the Medicare age to birth. And that way you'd be on Medicare from birth to death. That's really what um, single payer is. So it's a way of publicly financing healthcare, but still privately delivering it. Um, and by publicly financing it, we actually can save a huge amount of money so that the delivery of care can actually be much more robust than what people are getting currently on Medicare, Medicaid, and in many cases in their private insurance. Yes, I remember when I was working on Sheila Kuehl's single payer health care bill here in California back in 2004, um, I was saying that we would save $20 billion in the first year alone because how we would do that, we would consolidate down from 1,500 individual plans, which is what we had back then, to one plan, um, and we would eliminate the administrative costs of that and the marketing costs, as well as the CEO salaries. And I just looked up, the CEOs of Anthem, Cigna, and Aetna now make $17 million a year, plus the uh, shareholder dividends. So if we got rid of Stop all that. of that, we would have been able to save, uh, you know, twenty billion dollars, which would have been enough to sh insure the eight million Californians that didn't have health insurance at the time with much better plan. We would have had vision, we would have had dental, we would have had mental health, um, home health care, and all sorts of things, and um, we couldn't get it passed. So I think everybody who watches my show is enough of a progressive to know why we couldn't get it passed. But for those who are new to the issue, why don't you talk about that? Well, um, the reason we didn't get it passed in 2009 on a national basis, I can talk about that. Um, that was because single payer or Medicare for all never even got a seat at the table. We never were allowed to even bring it up into the conversation. So 
unfortunately, when President Obama was um, still a state senator, he he was quoted as saying, you know, I believe in a single payer national health program. But before we do that, first, we've got to win back the House and win back the Senate and win back the White House. Um, well, we did all of those things in 2009. And then suddenly uh, he wasn't interested in allowing single payer to have a seat at the table. Well, let's talk about that seat at the table, because I remember when Margaret Flowers, and this was before I had met her, and um, I just remember being so impressed, and now I found out that you were in on that too, basically interrupted the hearing that Max Baucus was having to ask uh, why was there no single-payer advocate on at the table? Can you describe that? Well, it was um, May of 2009, and uh, Senator Baucus uh, was then the chair of the Senate Finance Committee, which was one of the committees of jurisdiction for the um, uh, health reform effort. And, <coughs> excuse me, he, um, he was having a series of roundtable discussions that were by invitation only. And the idea was that he was inviting all of the, the people who might be able to contribute to um, a better understanding of how we might improve or reform our healthcare system. And so Physicians for a National Health Program asked to have a representative speak at one of his roundtables. And we were informed that we would there would not be a an invitation extended. So he had his first um, round table and we were not invited. And there were going to be um, two more of them. So when the second one came around, we again asked for a seat and were told again that that wouldn't be forthcoming. So eight of us uh, put on our business suits and went to the hearing and sat in the um, audience. And when uh, Senator Baucus brought the meeting to order, we one after another got up and asked or made a statement about why single payer was not being given uh, an opportunity to be discussed. You got hauled out of the meeting, well, right? In handcuffs, yes. We were all arrested and spent the day in um, in jail and then, um, you know, had a couple more trips to court and ultimately uh, had community service um, and probation for six months. See, that's pretty outrageous. And we, still I mean, get, and we still didn't get a seat at the table. And you still didn't get a seat at the table. Now, tell me yeah. this. What in, you're a doctor. First of all, what kind of medicine do you practice and what caused you to become a single payer advocate? Well, I'd ha be really happy to tell you about that. Um, I'm a psychiatrist and I'm actually in private. I, I'm retired now, but I was in private practice. Um, and for many years, I was an employed physician. So I was kind of protected from knowing, you know, sort of what our, our health care system is like or how difficult it is to deal with insurance companies because I I was employed. I got a paycheck. I saw patients. Um, but then I opened up a private practice and suddenly I'm wearing a small business owner's hat as well as a psychiatrist's white coat. And that was a real eye-opening experience, Lauren. And I was living in Maryland at the time. I decided to get involved in my state medical society. And we actually introduced a piece of legislation that was designed to get the insurance company networks to be accurate when they would put in a, a list of providers on their network and say, these are all the psychiatrists in Southern Maryland, for example. Um, when I actually looked at that list and called all the numbers, what I discovered is that I was actually the only practicing uh, psychiatrist in Southern Maryland, even though their network said they had over 20 of them. So we introduced the bill, it passed, and silly me, I actually thought that I had accomplished something. But of course, I didn't realize that um, a bill that it, that it becomes law doesn't have any teeth until it has regulations written. So when the regulations were written, 
two years later. Um, they were written by the lobbyist for the insurance company. And it was at that point that I realized that in, in the United States, it's just not possible to get the for-profit insurance companies to play fair. You cannot even legislate them to play fair. They will always have enough money and enough lawyers to figure out a way to work around whatever legislation you pass. And what we saw in 2009 and 2010 is that same thing play out on a national level. So what happened to me in Maryland in a tiny piece of legislation just happened all over again um, in 2010 with the passage of the Affordable Care Act, which was really yes. nothing more than an enormous gift yes. to the for-profit insurance industry. Right. Well, I wanted to backtrack because I had meant to say before we got to Obamacare in, 20, uh, in 2009, I had meant to talk about Hillary Care because I remember I wasn't really an activist in the 90s. I was a stay-at-home mom and raising my kids, remodeling my house, doing all that kind of yuppie stuff before I became a full-fledged activist. But I do remember watching those Harry and Louise commercials and how much money they spent to kill this Hillary Care program, which I later found out that, yes, they were calling it universal health care, but in fact, it was really something called managed competition, which meant that the insurance companies were, the private insurance companies were still going to be involved. So even that, they wouldn't let pass. I would like you to talk about um, what happened with Obamacare. We spoke about this in the pre-interview specifically how um, he ran on single payer, saying that it would be uh, the, the best program, but we couldn't get it politically, but he was surely going to have a public option. And then he threw the public option under the bus. Can you talk about that? So what happened in 2009 is that um, the Affordable Care Act was beginning to take shape. And what we saw was that in order to engage the, the progressive um, liberal element um, to buy into the Affordable Care Act, um, we were offered and told that the legislation would include a public option. And what that meant was that in addition to people uh, being offered insurance on the um, in the marketplace from various for-profit insurance companies, there would also be the option uh, to purchase insurance um, from essentially a public option from the government. There would be a, a government-funded bill as uh, or policy as well, and that's what was called the public option. Well, what we know about public option is that while it sounds good and it did get an awful lot of liberals to um, to think that they were um, accomplishing something that might move towards a, a national, an actual fully publicly funded healthcare system, um, what really happens is that public options just don't work very well. Because as I pointed out before, um, insurance companies are really, really adept at uh, cherry picking the healthiest people into their plan and lemon dropping the unhealthy sick people into the public plans. And we knew that was what was going to happen. But actually what really happened is that we didn't even get a public option that, as you pointed out, got thrown under the bus as a, um, it was just a, a, it was horse traded with the insurance industry to get them to continue to stay in the game and agree to eliminate um, pre you know, the, the ban on, or to include a ban on pre-existing conditions um, and a couple of other of the provisions um, and just eliminate the public option. And that's how we ended up with the Affordable or Unaffordable Care Act. Yes, I remember following those discussions uh, in 
a blog called Fire Dog Lake. Uh, that mm -hmm. was Jane Hampshire's blog. And I don't even know if she runs that blog. I don't see it anymore. But she was keeping track. She had a reporter there in the Senate keeping track of the whipping that I believe Michael Bennett, who is the senator from Colorado, was trying to whip people for that, and maybe Sherrod Brown. Um, and it was said at the time that had Obama lobbied for it, it would have happened. But we know that he didn't. So um, really, it, it all comes back to money in politics. And when Bernie was out here speaking on behalf of Prop 61, which the industry spent $126 million lobbying against, this was a bill that would have lowered prescription drug costs for just 14% of Californians. These were the Californians that are on government programs. That's the only ones that they could control. But the, the, even the 14% was not acceptable for big pharma. So they spent $126 million to oppose this. And actually, what is shameful is that there is a candidate running for chair of the California Democratic Party by the name of Eric Bauman, who at the same time, he already had a job in the um, legislature working for the uh, assembly leader. Um, he took $12,500 a month from Big Pharma to lobby against this bill. And the guy is a nurse by profession. So needless to say, I'm supporting his opponent, uh, Kimberly Ellis, who was endorsed by the California Nurses Association. But back to what happened in 2009. So as you said, it is unaffordable. I will tell you that before my um, divorce was finalized uh, just recently, um, I've been <laughs> separated longer than divorced, 16 years. And one of the reasons was to maintain my ex-husband, to be on my ex-husband's health care because I um, got cancer in 2007, throat cancer, which I survived. But I mean, fortunately for me, we hadn't finalized the divorce and I was still on his health care. And then I had to remain on his health care. Um, so the one thing that I guess Obama did do is get rid of that pre-existing conditions thing. But basically, because we've been married and filing separately all these years, I can't use my own income, which is next to nothing. So with his income, my health insurance under Obamacare was a silver plan, a preferred provider's plan, because I did want to use my own doctors, um, my own specialists, uh, was $650 a month, which is really unaffordable. And then it went up to $850 a month in January. So tell us about um, Senate uh, House Bill uh, 676, John Conyers' bill that he's been introducing for 14 years and why we think we're going to get it now. Well, it is exciting that this year when the bill was introduced, it started off with 51 co-sponsors. And as of today, the last time I checked, and it literally is, you have to check it every couple of hours, we're up to 84 co-sponsors. And that is an exciting movement. Um, and what, what we're seeing is that all of the people who, um, who finally got some, some benefit from the Affordable Care Act, um, because it did help 20 million people get insurance, although for many of them it was still um, that they're underinsured, as you described, you know, um, you have a card, but you're not sure you can afford to actually use it. Um, but that and the, and the Medicaid expansion did help um, some people. And now they're realizing that the Republicans want to take that away from them. And that makes them very scared. It's called loss aversion. And people will try awfully hard to hang on to something that they're afraid of losing. And what we're offering is something even better than that is that going forward, we really can have a national health program. Excuse me, I'm going to cough. <coughs> Allergies. Um, we really can have a national health program that is publicly funded and conservatively financed, which we think will appeal to the Republican voters um, and to the Republican Congress. 
and that it is also privately delivered with much more liberal benefits, which I think should appeal to everyone. So we are seeing a lot of movement, uh, a lot of action in town halls across the country of people who, they may be there, uh, I, at least in uh, their intention is to be there as um, supporters and defenders of the Affordable Care Act. But what we find is as soon as somebody stands up and says, but what I really want is a national health program, what I really want is Medicare for all, all of a sudden the whole room starts clapping and cheering. That was my experience at the town hall I attended in Nashville with my congressman. And um, Margaret Flowers has seen the same thing at numerous town halls in Maryland. And we hear that around the country. So there's a lot of action and a lot of interest finally in um, moving beyond the Affordable Care Act to what we needed in the first place and and now people get it, but they're really beginning to get it. Even, I mean, Charles Krauthammer talked about it in the Washington Post on Friday, um, a, a very conservative reporter. And he's even saying, um, if, if, you know, if we don't look out, we're going to end up with single payer. <laughs> and we're saying, yeah, let's hope so. Yes. Well, it's really interesting because we do see this as an opportunity. And for those who are watching in California, we also have uh, Senate Bill 562, which is introduced by Ricardo Lara, and it's a single payer bill. And that makes life really easy for me as an activist, because now I have something that I'm working on that I can help advance at the uh, state level and the federal level. And for example, um, you probably, or may, I don't know if you've heard of these groups, Justice Democrats, Bold Progressives, Our Revolution, um, maybe DFA is gonna join on. Uh, they have been posting these memes of the Congress people who have not signed on. And every day they update the meme and we're supposed to all be calling these Congress people to ask them to please co-sponsor. And I remember Emma Vigland at the beginning of last week, Emma Vigland from the Young Turks, she did a show in which she said Tulsi Gabbard, you know, who's a great progressive and a great Bernie supporter, his name was not on there and this is nuts, we gotta call her. And with, by the end of the week, she was on there. I think she was probably She's surprised she got so many calls. And, um, and so, like, for instance, this coming Sunday, there's going to be something called a rally to end child poverty. And it's going to be here in Los Angeles because California has the most children living in poverty of any state in the country. And John Lewis is going to be the special guest. Uh, Karen Bass, whose district it is, is going to be there. And both Lewis and Bass are co-sponsors. But guess who's coming to this? Nancy Pelosi. Nancy Pelosi, who, if you haven't seen the Jimmy Dore episode of her dancing around a question about Medicare for all, it's positively hysterical. So we're going to go there and we're going to have signs for HR, you know, 676. And also Autumn Burke, who is the state assemblywoman whose district this is in, she has not co-authored uh, the Ricardo Lara bill. So we're also going to have signs for that one. So this is what we need to do. We need to start, you know, showing up at these town halls. Um, Holly Mitchell yeah. is having one this coming Friday where I've asked people to try to, you know, people in her district to try to organize a contingent to go to that because she also hasn't signed on. And when I called her office, they said she was looking to see how they were going to improve, you know, the Affordable Care Act. In the few minutes that we have left in the show, I want to talk about Bernie Sanders because he scared us last week. Mar Margaret Flowers wrote an article about how he was floating out there. And I think also he was on Anderson Cooper talking about the public option, talking about lowering the Medicare age. And she wrote an article about how this was like Howard Dean, what Howard Dean did. And um, it caused a lot of us to, you know, panic because we were thinking, oh, no, you know, the, the people that have abandoned Bernie, like there were people that thought he sold out when he endorsed Hillary. Those people were saying, oh, here's another example of Bernie selling out because he wants to ingratiate himself with the Democrats. And then there were people like me who always ha have an open mind. And I know that Bernie is very strategic and I watch what he does very carefully. 
And I'm thinking, okay, what are you doing here with this, Bernie? Are you telling us we need to be calling you so that you stand firm with Medicare for All, which is, of course, what I did and what a lot of others did. Um, and then you guys had a meeting. So what did you find out? Yeah. Well, there were four of us, um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Czar is uh, the past president of PNHP, and myself, and, and Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zeese from healthoverprofit.org, um, uh, the HOPE campaign. And uh, we really just wanted to sit down with um, Senator Sanders' staffer, health staffer, um, and, and clarify kind of what was what kind of bill Senator Sanders was going to introduce, and also to clarify um, what this we were hearing about lowering the Medicare age or uh, putting in a, some kind of public option. And so it it really is important to um, go to the source and ask questions and get things clarified before you um, kind of get all worked up because sometimes it's much ado about nothing. Um, so we we had a couple of specific things we wanted to clarify. And I'm happy to say that I can tell you that uh, the bill that Senator Sanders is going to introduce, and he's thinking it may not be till May, um, is going to be very much a national um, health, a national Medicare for all bill that will be um, much more like what he campaigned on and and not so much like the bill he introduced a couple of years ago, which is really a good thing. This bill is going to be much more aligned with H.R. 676, the House bill, um, which we have supported for many, well, since it was first introduced. So that's a good sign. And um, it is... We had also heard that uh, Peter Welch was going to introduce a companion bill in the House, which, again, would have been confusing because we already have a House bill. And so we were able to clarify that um, that's actually not going to happen. So there will be Senator Sanders' bill in the Senate and H.R. 676, John Conyers' bill in the House. That's really good news. Um, and Senator Sanders' bill is going to be a little bit more detailed and flesh out, uh, you know, put a little more meat on the bones of, of H.R. 676, which, again, is a good sign that legislator, you know, that they're legislatively wanting to um, really begin to turn this into a bill that is going to go somewhere. It's not just a placeholder bill anymore. As far as the public option and lowering the Medicare age, what um, what was explained to us is that, you know, as this is happening, President Trump also said um, that he was interested in working with the Democrats in a bipartisan way to try to improve the Affordable Care Act. And I think that what my sense is that what Senator Sanders was saying is other members of Congress may decide to put out there um, the option of lowering the Medicare age to 55 or introducing a public option as a way of seeing whether or not the Republicans are really interested in, in, in having any kind of bipartisanship um, in uh, fixing the Affordable Care Act. Well, you know, we already know that the Affordable Care Act is not fixable. As long as the for-profit insurance industry is in, in the equation, it's never going to be, it's never going to meet the requirement of universality and affordability and good comprehensive um, care. So maybe they'll, maybe they'll introduce it, maybe they won't, but frankly, I don't really care because it's irrelevant. What is, yes. what we need to be doing is exactly what you're going to be doing um, with Nancy Pelosi and what I did with my congressman, which is putting them on the spot at their town hall meeting, 
saying the words co-sponsor HR 676, or if you're in a senator's um, town hall meeting, then the messaging is, will you support and co-sponsor Bernie Sanders' single payer bill? And they, and then you need their, the constituents to be calling and demanding that day after day after day. Right. So we need, that's our job as activists, guys. We need to. That's our job. Well. Thank you so much for Carol, Carol, for being on my show and explaining this very exciting program, your organization. We thank you for all the years that you've worked on this, you and Margaret and, and Kevin and Robert and everybody in the country who's been working for single payer.